Um, so, uh, when I said I would speak, I didn't know what I was going to talk about, and then Ken said I was going to talk about the state of Go, and so that's what I'm going to talk about, which is great because I actually have a lot of things to say about that. Um, but I thought the best way to talk about today is to start by talking about where we were yesterday. <clears throat> and I thought I would go like right back to like how Go was originally received in the very first months, you know, back in the end of 2009. Um, and so I looked at the Golang Nuts archives from that time, and I noticed that like within the first few days, these threads uh, popped up, um, and they were, you know, very, very long threads, hundreds of posts a peach, a piece, uh, a peach. And um, then there were more complaints, which have persisted kind of to this day in various incarnations. Um, and this is the first Hacker News thread, maybe you can't see it. Um, but this is, this is only the section that was to do with braces and indentation. <laughs> and it was by far, it was like seven eighths of all of the posts were in this thread. And I like the way it actually indents so much. <laughs> At the end it was like two words per line on the page, which was kind of funny. Um, but, you know, within the first couple of months, we also had some historic moments. The first public language change um, was Rob's proposal to remove semicolons um, by popular demand. It's a great idea. And it was, I also wanted to mention this because I think it dispels this myth that a lot of people like to perpetuate that the Go team doesn't listen to what people say about Go and what they suggest. Um, the truth is actually that we, we really do listen to everything. Um, it doesn't mean that we necessarily agree with everything that's said. Um, and I think some people assume that means we haven't heard them because their argument is infallible. But in this case, you know, uh, it was an obvious win to drop the semicolons, which we did gladly, and the language is much better for it. And it's not the only example. Um, another early point of contention was the logo. So this is a post <laughs> to going nuts. Um, you know, it's obviously loved by at least someone, but I don't like it. If anyone has a good idea, I'd like to come up with something less, uh, well, no offense, etc. Um, so I've got the gopher kind of rolling his eyes here. I don't know if that comes across. Um, but the great response that I saw in that thread, which came really early on, was someone saying, oh, I found an appropriate logo, um, but I need someone to render it in line, line art. And this, this picture is, um, is that, <laughs> which, uh, which I thought was great. There were also some really astute posts that, where people kind of got it straight away. I liked this one. Um, the interesting thing I've noticed following the mailing list for a while is the constant inflow of people saying that Go absolutely needs such and such a feature from such and such language. Um, and there was also this thread, which I thought was uh, kind of apt. Alright, so that was yesterday. Today, and in the intervening years, um, we're now kind of at this position where we see articles like this one from Red Monk that was titled Go, the Emerging Language of Cloud Infrastructure, um, which I think Derek might say something about, maybe. Um, and I was really encouraged by this graph, which shows the percentage of Go language use on OLO, which is the uh, open source uh, language stats website, Are one we of them. One yet? We might be at one now, I'm not sure. <laughs> but. The interesting thing about this graph, it looks like, oh gee, we're heading to 1%. But when you consider that all of the other like mainstream languages like C++, Java, and so on, they're only at like 10% or less each piece, right? So approaching one-tenth of C is uh, pretty substantial. Um, we also have tons of user groups, including this one. Um, I've visited probably nearly 20 of them around the world, um, and they continue to spring up. And I think it's one of the most sort of rewarding and satisfying things about being involved in Go is visiting these groups um, all around the world and seeing like-minded people get together and, and embrace Go. And we also had GoForCon. Was anyone in this room at GoForCon? <coughs> you, yeah. All right. So was it awesome? Yeah. 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 I guess, I guess so. Yeah. Um, it was. It was great. Um, for those of you who weren't there, it was a three-day event. We had 700 people sold out, 24 talks. We had a panel, uh, and amazingly, like on the third day on the hack day, we had four hours straight of lightning talks from the community, just people who spontaneously signed up to speak 
we just had a ton of uh, people really excited to talk about uh, all the cool stuff they were doing in Go. So that Can was great. thank the guy that put it all together? I think he's Yeah, here. yeah, so uh, Eric, one of the organizers, is here. Uh, <laughs> thanks very much. The other was, was um, Brian Kettleson, who also deserves applause. Um, oh, wait. Where did my slides go? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, sorry. I apologize. <laughs> okay. So the attitudes to the gopher have also changed. Um, we now have uh, the gopher in various incarnations, the most sort of famous being the plush gopher. We now have him in three colors. Although I'm told that apparently if you're colorblind, the purple and blue look the same, which is kind of hilarious. We offered one of our contributors a, a new purple gopher, and he was like, I've already got one of those. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Um, and you know, the gopher has also been in, in large sizes. It's the Core OS gopher bus, which is totally amazing, and blew everyone away, especially Renee, who was the, the, the designer of the gopher, who was thrilled. And um, you know, I think if there's any testament to the success of our mascot, it's this. <laughs> um, this was uh, Lewitt, uh, whose surname I'm not gonna try and pronounce, um, from the Netherlands, who, yeah, he did that, <laughs> which, <laughs> You know, I'm not a tattoo guy, it's not really my thing, but it's pretty amazing. Um, although I should probably mention that while that is definitely the first tattooed Go Gopher, it's not the first of uh, Renee's creations to be tattooed. So, there you go. Um, so, Go 1.3 was released last week. Has anybody not installed this yet? Like, do ah, you gotta leave and do it now. <laughs> Um, so that was, you know, six months in the making, or six months and a couple of weeks. We missed the date by 18 days, sorry. Um, but there's a lot of cool stuff uh, baked in. Um, you know, native client support, which is not the runs in Google Chrome native client support. It's the runs code safely in a sandboxed environment native client support. So we use that on the Go Playground and in the tour and so on to safely execute code. And um, there are, there's a lot of scope to use that in other kind of contexts too. Um, we've got the support for some new operating systems, um, which all came from the community, which was great. Um, you know, a lot of performance improvements. Uh, probably the most notable being the different stack management mechanism, um, which actually leads into this uh, precise GC of stacks. We did discontiguous stacks instead of. Uh, segmented stacks so that we could track. No, no. What's the, I am right, yeah, 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 yeah. So that we, so that we could do the precise GC. Uh, oh no, it's the other way around. Yeah, we needed, we, we needed to do the precise GC of stacks to do the contiguous stacks, which performs better and will be a benefit overall. Um, we moved part of the linker into the compilers um, so that incremental builds happen faster because they're making less work for the linker. Um, and something that people are really excited about, and I'm excited about, is the static analysis tools. So that's where we're at today. Um, and I'd just like to spend a little bit of time talking about kind of where we're headed um, in the future. So uh, we've got a couple of um, upcoming dedicated Go conferences. Um, we've got .go in Paris. Is anyone going to that? <laughs> I, I, Three of the people who were speaking, <laughs> a couple of others. Um, and there's also GopherCon India, which is happening in February um, 2015. So those are both really exciting. Um, and I guess the, the next thing on the horizon for the Go community is Go 1.4, um, which is due in just under six months from now. Um, and so I'd just like to talk a little bit about what we're hoping will appear uh, in it. So um, this is a list of new language features. Um, nope isn't a new keyword, it's just I'm just saying that there are no new features. Um, sorry. Oh yeah, it could be nop. That's, yeah, it's cleaner. Yeah, okay. Um, there's a proposal to canonicalize import paths. So if you use uh, uh, vanity import paths, say with, with Camly Store, 
Um, you can import packages from familysort.org slash foo slash bar. Um, that's actually using a, a little trick which is documented in the Go tool. It's actually an alias for this um, source repository hosted here on, on googlesource.com. Um, and what, this, what the canonical import path mechanism, which has not been decided, it's just being proposed, what, will it, what it will allow is for you to specify in your repository what the canonical base path of that repository is. And so if you check out the code um, from, say, if I tried to check out Camly Store from this path, it would give me an error or it would just transparently check it out into the right place. Um, and what this lets us do is, if we want to move something um, from, one, you know, from one actual place to another, we can be sure that everyone is still just using it from the same canonical import path, um, which will save us a lot of trouble. Um, it's also going to have a nice effect on GitHub's forking model. I think it's a, a big source of pain for a lot of people is um, they fork a GitHub repo um, and suddenly all of the import paths change if you're using GoGet. And I'm sure, has anybody experienced that problem before? Yeah, a few people, right? Um, and so, you know, the way to get around that today is you can just change the Git remote um, using the Git command, um, but keep the code in the original place even though you're working on a fork. Um, but what this will allow us to do is actually specify when we're forking the code just to, spend a fo just to send a pull request or whether we actually intend to fork the code and have it live at a new location. So that's, that's the idea. Um, another proposal which is currently kind of generating some f uh, fervor in the Golang dev mailing list is this uh, internal packages proposal and that's the ability to have packages that can only be imported um, by sort of peers in the same repository or under the same path. Okay. Um, and the main use case for this right now is that we're working towards translating the Go compiler from C to Go. Um, and as part of that, the compiler will comprise, uh, be comprised of multiple packages. Um, and we want to be able to define packages for the implementation of the compiler, but we don't want um, people like outside of the compiler to be importing those packages. And so there are a lot of cases where splitting things up into packages makes sense, but it doesn't actually make sense for you to define an interface that is then exported to the rest of the world and then uh, you know people can just use because it's, it's not necessarily going to be used properly. Um, we're going to move the standard library inside the repository from source package to just slash source. So the structure will be much more like a normal Go workspace or Go path. Not much more to say about that. Um, we'd like to implement some um, throttling on file system access. So currently right now, if you just launch a million Go routines that open a million files, um, you end up spinning up a million operating system threads and your program dies. Um, what we'd like to do is make that work similar to how networking works, where um, the, uh, the OS package will actually uh, throttle access to the file system so that only you know a sane amount of operating system threads are actually opened um, and so it means that you can kind of write the naive obviously correct code to just kind of hammer your file system without actually hammering your file system which should be quite nice um, there's a proposal which is forthcoming to introduce a go generate command um, and so this is seen to be a convenience for uh, generating Go source files from various sources, like using Yak or generating protobuf code, or uh, embedding HTML files or binary files in Go in Go packages, um, and there are other ideas that you could imagine that this kind of code generation could be used for. Um, and uh, the idea is you have some directives in your Go source files, and you use Go generate and the package name to regenerate those source files. Um, so expect a proposal in the next few days on that score. Um, there's also a bunch more toolchain work coming, um, support for GCC Go in, in, in the Go tool, and that means GCC Go being able to compile um, the Go tool, and that should make it a lot easier for people to use GCC Go. Uh, support to just embed data files directly in Go programs uh, via the linker, so not having to first translate files into Go source code before embedding them in. Um, so improvements to the race detector, uh, and of course, continuing the transition from C to Go, we hope, you know, we've already started rewriting the linker in Go. Uh, 
there's an assembly rewrite on the way as well, and we might have the translation of the of GC, the compiler, into Go. Uh, Dimitri's going to work on a better garbage collector and memory allocator. So the original, the current me memory allocator is based on tcmalloc, which is a, a C++ memory allocator, basically. Um, but there's definitely a lot of things we can do to make it more Go oriented um, that will be better performance. Um, and there are some other ways to uh, reduce reduce GC pause time by doing the concurrent sweep phase, um, which kind of ties into that kind of work. What are you saying? Oh, it's already done. Yes. I told you to look at these slides and you didn't say anything. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Dimitri. Well, it's already done then. Sorry. Um, I was looking at the wrong design doc. Okay. Um, yeah, and so we want to see some more runtime changes. This stuff hasn't been done though, right? right. Yeah, good. Okay. <laughs> so just stop doing stuff without telling me. Jeez. Um, and yeah, we want we want to also start com um, converting the uh, the runtime um, parts of the runtime as well from C to Go. Um, there's a bunch of package changes on the horizon as well. Um, maybe some better structuring features in the template package. So being able to have templates that inherit from other templates, um, and some other kind of efficiency things and Unicode seven support. But God knows what that means. Um, I know also there's people who want to work on um, native client for ARM and uh, PowerPC64 and also ARM64 support. And that kind of ties into um, another interesting feature, which is Go support for Android. Uh, uh, David Crosher is here, is uh, working on um, providing Go support for Android in the same way that C and C++ are supported uh, in, via the NDK. And the goal is to be able to write games. So we'd like to provide some kind of framework for writing games. And it's based on the great work of Alias Naur um, and others from the community. And you can follow that link to see more about it. There's also a longer list of to-dos, which is the go 14 to do doc, golongorg slash s slash go 14 to do. And uh, I could probably take a question. I think I've run over time. Anyone have anything? Generics? <laughs> Generics. <laughs> Didn't I mention them already? OK, that's it. You guys have any shockers under the seat for any time somebody says the word generic? <laughs> <laughs> cool. Oh, yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew.